Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and get started. And um, hopefully, if all goes according to plan, which you know how plans go, uh, we will have a little bit of time for some uh, questions and answer session towards the end. Um, first on my agenda is to commend you all for being here so late in the afternoon. Uh, I get the distinct feeling we're standing between you and the event at the museum, right? Which sounds kind of uh, fun, so uh, bear with us, and we appreciate you spending the afternoon with us. Um, I am, my name is Valerie Newhart. I am the Deputy Executive Director in the Office of Trade Relations at Customs and Border Protection. My office is uh, directly uh, reports to the Office of the Commissioner, so uh, we do quite a bit around stakeholder engagement in exporting and importing um, for under Customs and Border Protection Regulatory Authority and their statutory authority too. So um, we always feel the more that our industry partners are educated, uh, the less you have to do with, deal with us negatively, right? We wanna hear from you positively. And I am very honored to have a very distinct panel here with us today, distinguished panel. And so I would like to take a few moments to introduce them to you and then we'll dive right into our dialogue for this afternoon. Um, first uh, to my right here is Jeff Powell, and he is the president of C.H. Powell and the chairman of the board at the National Customs Brokers and Forwarders Association of America. And Mr. Powell um, has been with the company uh, for quite some time, and I'm going to say he's 20, you know, so uh, when he first started. But um, in fact, Mr. Powell's grandfather started the company back in 1919, so his company is celebrating 100 years today or this year rather um, and he is a customs broker and as I mentioned the uh, brokerage is family owned um, he after graduating Georgetown University uh, he went to work for the uh, family business at CH Powell um, interestingly enough he is such a great and phenomenal subject matter expert that he has been asked to serve um, and has served on the customs commercial operations um, at Advisory Committee, and that is a federally mandated committee in which um, they serve as advisors to the government. He has also served on the President's Export Council subcommittee, um, so we are really happy that he has chosen to spend the afternoon with us today. And um, to his right is Julie Brown, and she is the President and CEO of the Georgia Foreign Trade Zone, um, Inc. It's a private nonprofit organization that is is um, in place to support Georgia businesses by reducing or eliminating tariffs and fees on imported merchandise through in or out of the foreign trade zone. And uh, she has uh, more than 40 years experience and she also started when she was probably 10. Um, so doesn't she look great? She does, right? Um, and um, she uh, has been instrumental in the um, growth of companies' bottom line and profit market. So um, we are really happy that she is here with us today. She has led the Georgia Foreign Trade Zone um, Inc. company. She uh, and she's been the founding member of the World Free Zones organization. And so we are happy she is going to spend the afternoon with us, educating us a little on the benefits of foreign trade zone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and next to Julie is Ron Olenek, and he is the head of an international trade practice, and he is a partner practicing at Holland and Knight's firm in Washington, D.C. His area of expertise is in international trade regula regulation, uh, but he brings a broad range of experience um, with him, and we are excited to have him as he will be touching on various aspects of the importing exporting process, um, in addition to classification, value, rules of origin, and you're going to all know what that means by the end of this afternoon. So, um, thank you for joining us, Ron. And. 
Last but certainly not least is Shane Williams, and um, he is the Economic Development Director for the Port of Houston Authority, and he oversees the Port Authority's Foreign Trade Zone number 84. Um, but he has um, also been involved with other foreign trade zone sites, and as an Economic Development Director, he interacts with brokers and other entities that are part of the overall global supply chain um, system and so um, he oh one other important thing to note is that he is currently the sitting secretary on the board of the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones um, so we are thrilled to have him and our distinguished guest here with their abundance of um, specialized experience so thank you all for joining us today thank you. Um, I wanted to um, just kind of give you a little bit of what you should be expecting out of our time this afternoon. We have one hour, so you're not going to be an expert by the time you leave. But certainly, uh, we do want you to know a couple of things. Um, we at least want you to know and be aware of some of the complexities on importing and exporting, right? Um, and at least you can find some resources and understand that there are resources available to you in addition to our um, experts that we're spending the afternoon with today. Uh, we are very fortunate to have our subject matter experts here and um, they are going to share some of their um, experiences with you for the time that we have together. Uh, the other thing I want you to know is if you get anything out of our discussion today, please leave here with an awareness that importing and exporting is not impossible. It may have its challenges, it may have its difficulties, but there are some true benefits to be gained from involving your business in this process. Um, and you can always reach, up, reach out and follow up with one of us after this, um, and, and we'll make sure that you have our contact information either um, by email, I'll speak to, I lost my room person, but uh, we'll make sure that you get that information. I'm not sure that I saw that on any of the materials, but we'll make sure that you have that so that you are comfortable to follow up with this after. All right, so we won't waste any more of your time. Uh, we're going to dive right in, and we're going to dive right in with a very, um, a, a very important question. Again, to my point on resources, that's the most important thing to know, where to go and who to talk to, right, when you want to start something. And so I'm going to ask each of our guests to share a relevant resource that would be available for either additional information or guidance around the customs process, and that would be whether importing or exporting, and we're going to start with Jeff. Sure. Thank you, Val, <clears throat> and thanks, everybody, for, uh, for being here. Um, you know, from a resource side, as a licensed customs broker, uh, we are regulated by U.S. Customs and Border Protection to transact import business on behalf of, of, of importers. We're licensed by the Federal Maritime Commission to transact export business, so we are a regulated industry, but we are commercially driven. Uh, we're there to, to, to make a profit. Uh, we're there to service our customers. Um, approximately 95% of all imports that come into the United States are done through a customs broker. It is not mandated, but we as a broker need to show our value, you know, in, in, in the trade community. Uh, so we're a great source of, of information. Not all of our customers are large multinational corporations. Actually, most of our, our customers are small and medium-sized businesses who are importing or exporting. Uh, so we as an association, uh, one of our mantras is our best customers are those who are most educated. So we take a lot of a time and, and effort to, to educate our customers from an association point of view. We work very closely with CBP and the other government agencies, so you can find a plethora of information out on CBP's website. Um, they've got how-to guides, um, uh, an extensive FAQ out there on, on anything you want to know about importing into the United States. Uh, there's also a messaging service that you can sign up for that'll update you on everything from the automated commercial environment to uh, certain trade regulations and policies. Um, so we work very closely with customs on that because I think they find too, it's not a gotcha mentality. It's, it's, it's there to educate the public on how to best import and export. Uh, so they provide a lot of very, very good information. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we even have a video and it's less than five minutes. So it's to appeal to everyone's um, 
uh, amount, the amount of free time we all have, right? So less than five minutes, it's on our website, and it's a great start. So on the Customs and Border Protection website, you can go there, look at it really quick, and let it help you uh, formulate some additional questions for any of the brokers or any of our guest um, subject matters that matter experts that we have here today. Julie, what yes. about some resources? Okay, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for having me here and for all of you coming this afternoon to... Uh, hear a little bit about the customs process. Um, as you mentioned, the organization that I am with is Georgia Foreign Trade Zone based in Atlanta, Georgia. And our sole purpose is to work with companies that are in Georgia to help them use the uh, Foreign Trade Zones program. Foreign Trade Zone is a federal program here in the U.S. It's within the U.S. Department of Commerce. And again, our job is to facilitate the use of that program with the company and Washington and with customs. Um, the, the resources that are available are for the foreign trade zone specific piece of this are somewhat limited but very good. I'll echo what you said about the, uh, the website and the customs brokers. Those are excellent resources for this. But in addition to that, organizations like the one that I represent out of Atlanta are located in every state and, and multiple organizations really, and we're called the grantee. So we have the grant of authority to manage the foreign trade zone program. That's the first stop, I would say, resource for a company that is considering using the foreign trade zone program. That grantee can help introduce them to the relevant uh, players in, in, with that program and can uh, facilitate, again, the application process that a company would have to go through to uh, obtain foreign trade zone designation. Also, the economic development uh, groups within a state are great resources for this. The Georgia Department of Economic Development is on our is on my board of directors. They uh, have a booth here at this conference. So another really good resource for the overall importing exporting, and then they would be somewhat of a resource for the foreign trade zone. But they are ready to refer the company, the individual, to the group like Georgia Foreign Trade Zone to give you information on how to set that up. All right, thank you, Julie. And for those of you that might be asking what is a foreign trade zone, we're going to spend a few more minutes on that. Um, we're going to get to that, so um, we'll, we'll get there, I promise. All right, um, Ron, how about a couple resources for our attendees, either on an importing or exporting side? Sure, Valerie. Well, of course, as a lawyer, you know my answer is <laughs> always go to your lawyer. <laughs> No, but seriously, I, I, actually, I think um, there's a lot of resources out there. You've got to do your research. You've, you've got to, it's a complex system. Uh, as Valerie points out, it is doable. It does work. It can work very smoothly. Uh, putting the research into it and talking to the right per people, uh, getting those right, getting that right support group, if you will, and, and the customs broker, uh, to me, is really the place to start. You want to talk to your customs broker. You want to get a feel for what's possible for, for your good, for where you're coming from. He might send you to the FTZ for, for work there um, if, if that's going to fit in with your overall business plan. Right? We're talking about how, how to move your business forward. And so how do we... How do we use the resources that are available in getting through the customs process to, to, make, to make business, to make profit? And so customs broker is important. Uh, foreign trade zone in the right situations, depending on what your business is and how it's going to work, uh, is important. Of course, bringing your lawyer in at some point is important. Certainly, you don't want to talk to us when there's problems. Right? You could talk to me now or you could talk to me later. It's a lot better to talk to me up front where we can help with some of these issues about crafting that business strategy and taking advantage of uh, different parts of customs, preference programs, FTZs, et cetera, to get the goods in at, at the lowest rate in the smoothest manner. All right, that sounds great. So now, are you asking yourself, what is the preference program? Because that's a good question that we're going mm -hmm. to address 
in a little bit um, because we do have trade programs that would be very relevant to um, enhancing your bottom line and your profit margin. Um, so Shane, you bring to us a level of expertise within the Port Authority that differs from each of us up here. What would you say would be um, a great resource? Yeah, I think um, being at the end is kind of like being the least smart person <laughs> in the uh, study group in college. You're yeah, clean up. Say, yeah, clean up. Everything they <laughs> said was right. I'm going with it. I get the A too. No, um, I think, yeah, they've touched on a lot of them. Port, different port authorities will have um, information about um, importing and exporting specifically within their port. Um, it's obviously a federal thing that you're doing, but different ports of entry um, will have different local offices and different ways th things happen. So I would definitely, if you're looking into coming into a certain point in, uh, port in the United States, you would want to visit their site. Um, at worst, they're going to give you links to all of these groups that uh, we've talked about already. Um, so the local port site um, would have good information. Again, I would echo the economic development groups, even the International Economic Development Council um, would be a point of reference that could then give you areas, um, if you're looking at specific different regions of the country, of who their contact person is, um, and then the World Trade Center. So I think um, we've pretty much hit on everything, but I definitely would say to, to look at uh, the port if you're looking at um, doing importing and exporting because not only are you going to find a lot of these resources that we've spoken about, you're going to start to get information on how that port works specifically with their uh, rates and fees um, to use their dockage um, and um, different issues that maybe they've faced that are specific to their region um, and kind of get all the information at one spot there. All right, and, and you bring up a good point. Um, it's real important that as you hear from each of these subject matter experts, their, their roles are critical to the overall process, right? They can help you, they can help you navigate one or both or a combination of them depending on how you establish your process. But um, each of these types of entities, is, they develop very strong working relationships with Customs and Border Protection at the headquarters level, at the port level, or at a more regional level. So. Um, so that is why they are most familiar with, with their lane of expertise. So I think our next question will start with Ron and we'll jump around a little bit. Um, but what I want to know from each of them, and if you can share with our attendees here today, um, if you can possibly give some insight into some of the obstacles or delays that you have seen or have experienced when um, foreign investors are trying to either bring equipment into the U.S. or goods into the U.S. Um, or they're relying on a U.S.-based entity to get goods out of the U.S. Ron, could you start? Sure, absolutely. Uh, on the in inbound side, the, uh, I sort of break it down into to three three separate problem areas. Is it you? Is it the US government? Or is it one of your commercial uh, parties involved? And that may be both in the transaction itself, but it may also be your logistics providers, others in the transportation chain, right? So you first, right? Customs job is to spot anomalies. Right? They're masters at looking at the paperwork, the invoice, the entry documentation that, that <coughs> describe the product and, and the classification and the duties owed, the shipping documents, um, other documentation that you're supplying to customs as part of that entry package. They're looking for missing fields. They're looking for inconsistencies in the description of the goods. They're looking for inconsistencies in the value in the, in the tariff classification. That's their job. And then they come back and ask some more questions. They're just trying to clean up the paperwork, if you will. But if your paperwork isn't clean in the, in the first place, you're likely to start running into problems. Your goods get held up. They've got questions about it. That's all on you. There's a lot of pieces of paper, and they don't always match. Over the years, we've seen some wild things in, in that paperwork. Um, is it the US government? That's, that's less of 
of in your control, but is policy changing? Is there a new tariff on China or on a certain product? Right? Those things come up and you've got less control over that. Those things we just have to deal with in the business. The last one, the question in the commercial transaction, has somebody else fallen down on the job? Is it the broker? Is it your uh, cargo carrier? Is it the time charter who's, who's actually moving your goods? Is it somebody at the port who's done something wrong, mistake or otherwise, and holding your goods up? So working through to figure out where the problems might occur and trying to make sure the communications lines are open, the paperwork is as clean as possible, is going to get you through the fastest. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we ask a lot of questions. <laughs> I'll be honest, we do. Um, so you want to get to the point where we're not asking so many questions, most likely. But Shane, how about you? Can you share um, an experience in which you have observed some obstacles or delays? Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of touches on his last point on our side. Um, it's people that aren't aware of the full chain of, of where their product, if it's being imported, has either come from or who's handling it all going out, whether they just assume they have a freight forwarder or a customs broker that's handling it all and then it gets tied up and we can't find it or they can't find it and we can't get the information necessary um, to be able to track it down for them. A lot of times probably not unlike customs, when you're dealing with the port, you just get the question of where is this product? And when we're asking, okay, who was handling it? Who did this? Who's the owner of record at this point? Um, if we can't get those answers, we can't help in the, a problem that could have been easily fixed or found you know, in 24 hours becomes something that we're all sticking our heads together trying to figure it out. And it's simply because chain of command or knowing who's handling what part of the process has kind of gotten lost. And so that's really when we do our educational things um, at Port Houston, uh, reaching out to small business owners and new exporters or importers. It really is to have your plan of how you're doing your import and your export and who all is touching the different points of it and then know exactly where their job starts and where that group's job stops and who's the point of reference at each step of it. And a lot of times through the government, through the port, and through those people that are helping you, if you know where it is in the chain and who had it last, you can easily figure out, oh, it just got pulled for extra screening, no big deal, we're taking care of it, um, rather than complete loss of who has it, what's going on, are there extra fines coming, is something gonna happen bad? Sure, sure, excellent. Thank you. Uh, Julie, what about the foreign trade zone Well, the fu process? a fundamental um, benefit and basis for a foreign trade zone facility is that when goods come in to a, to a port of entry, they can move to the foreign trade zone facility without really clearing customs yet. So in, in our situation, a couple of different companies I've dealt with, uh, one had issue with some labeling on some goods that had come in and they were able to move those directly to the approved foreign trade zone facility and take care of that labeling on the product within the facility. So they didn't have to deal with customs at the port and destroy the merchandise, return the merchandise. Uh, another benefit I think to the foreign trade zone facility would be with another company we've dealt with um, where, where the goods were being held up, delayed at the port of entry for different reasons. If a company has foreign trade zone approval, foreign trade zone designation for their facility, then again, those goods can move quickly from the port of entry to their company foreign trade zone facility, and that can be a huge benefit for them. And I'll, I'll add, um, you know, instead of us either seizing a product, destroying a product, um, delaying it even further, you have a few more options. You can go, you can rectify it within the zone, or you may even place it in the zone, do something else to it, and export it. So it never really entered the commerce of the U.S. And so it gives you a little, again, more resources and more options, um, especially if you're stuck in a delay of some sort and it starts to cost you money, because that's the last thing we all want. Uh, Jeff. So uh, as, as a customs broker, <clears throat> we have to understand uh, the Code of Federal Regulations 19. Does other 
CFRs 15, 49, hazardous materials. So using that acronym, CFRs, we look at some of the issues that, that importers run into are from the commercial side, disagreement between the importer and the, and the seller or the, the exporter um, and the importer. From the financial side, uh, whether there's a letter of credit, what financing tools are there, somebody isn't getting paid, it stops the good, or the regulatory side. What is your product? Do you know what it is? Have you done your, your homework? Uh, you know, as, as Ron stated, employ a customs broker, employ a customs attorney to see if there are any binding rulings on this particular product coming in to know exactly what your duty rate is. Are there any other government agency requirements on that? Do that well in advance because we find that many of the customers don't understand that. We're looking for certifications. We're looking for certificates of analysis, certificates of quality, which hold the goods up. And, and, and last but not least, the security side of it. Um, since 9-11, how we transact and receive data and provide that to the government so they can do their screening, all shipments coming into the United States, data needs to be provided prior to loading on board the vessel. If that is not here or that is not on board, CBP has the right to stop those goods at origin, but they also can stop them once they come here. And then it sits on the pier um, so what are the INCO terms between the seller and the buyer on here? Who is responsible for what charges? If it is delayed, who's paying the demurrage on that? Who's paying the trucking? Who's paying terminal handling charge? That's what we see where a lot of things are held up. So as a broker, we're in the middle of it trying to get the cargo moving off the pier, but nobody's willing to take responsibility for those charges. So all those things need to be done well in advance. That'll decrease you know, the amount of delays that one will have at the pier. All right, thank you. So um, I'm just gonna reiterate a couple of things here. The more you know about the product, the better, mm -hmm. right? And um, the more you know about who's handling it, when and throughout the process, again, the better. And also know that you have resources available to help you get out of that sticky situation or overcome the challenge. Um, and that, again, that's, that's important. So um, we're, gonna, we're gonna shift gears just a little bit and um, we're going to ask Shane a very specific question here. Uh, Shane, uh, can you share a little bit around what your port does at the Port Authority of Houston there uh, to provide anything specific to a company who's just learning about the process, yeah. um, either importing or exporting, and, and what that might be. Yeah, we do two real things. Um, first, we have a quarterly um, event, we call it Trade Link, um, that we've partnered with um, Department of Commerce, Small Business Association, um, XM Bank um, at different times, our World Trade Center, uh, which is called the Greater Houston Partnership, um, where we are, and then, of course, our group that basically is a half day event, uh, usually from about nine to one with lunch, uh, and really walks through all the different steps of, you know, we bring in uh, customs brokers, we bring in uh, customs officers, we bring in all those types of things. It really kind of is a 101 this that we're talking about but for four hours or so where we can really get into the weeds, um, try to bring in a small business that has done um, an import or export successfully for the first time um, in a recent year or, t or, or two and has become to kind of get the feel for it and doing it so they can walk through mistakes that they made, things they would try to tell friends to not do uh, that they did do um, and avoid. So we try to do that quarterly all throughout um, Houston's a really big city, so we try to do it throughout the different area um, in a different place each time. And then, again, with our World Trade Center, the Greater Houston Partnership, we usually do one big trade event about international trade, same concept, about three to four hours, talking through all the different things that we're going to try to hit on today, um, but just in a local example of things that we've seen or companies that we've seen, and always if we can get the actual actual company to come and speak on it, it's much better. But we found, you know, about, we've done this for about three years now, and we found 
a couple years before we started, we'd get we have a small business group division within the Port of Houston that tries to mentor and talk to businesses that are wanting to get into trade but are just a little scared of how to do it because it's a big, bad word sometimes. Um, and we never really got them over the hump. We got them to see why they should do it, where there's some benefits, um, but never really got them to pull the trigger and actually do importing or exporting. And then, so when we took it to that next level of having this event and bringing in other export experts that know about the specifics better than us, we really did see a little bit of an uptick in small to medium-sized businesses that are doing trade out of Houston. Great, great. And I'll share that um, many of the Customs and Border Protection ports are involved and, and leverage those types of trade events. It's usually a half day or a full day, and you can kind of go to the sessions that you feel are most applicable to you. Those are always very helpful, um, and, and those are usually advertised on the website. Yep. So if you know of the, the port that you may be importing or exporting through, I, I highly recommend you reach out to them. Um, okay, Julie, I have a question for you. We've, we've touched on foreign trade zones, and um, I have a feeling that many of our attendees here have heard of free trade zones. Um, so could you spend a little bit of time explaining the difference and what that means to our attendees? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. Um, and let me say too that the Foreign Trade Zone program, while it's been around in the US for many, many years, it was, uh, legislation was enacted back in the 1930s. Many companies, the majority of companies, and, and a lot of these are big businesses, really don't know much about it still. So. Uh, don't be um, intimidated if you don't know much about this. But to answer your question on the free zones, the foreign trade zone program in the US is really the free zone program to most everybody else in the world. We uh, are in the unique position of having the term foreign trade zone. Uh, the com I'll say first the common thing between the foreign trade zone program and other free zones, free trade zones, special economic zones, I'd say the common foundational piece is that they are all uh, encouraging economic development in the community and job growth. So we, we all are trying to do that in some different ways. Um, the main differences in the U.S. program and, and many other programs is that the U.S. program is really um, focused on the benefits that are related to customs, customs duties. So at a, at a minimum, you're going to delay your customs duty payments. You may reduce them, you may end up eliminating them. But the foreign trade zone program in the US is really tied to customs duties and some other um, processing fees that you may be able to reduce. And I say that because I know many free zones around the world have additional benefits and incentives. Uh, it may be additional tax incentives, uh, infrastructure, and those are all great. Um, it's just the U.S. program is, is focused, again, very narrowly on customs. A second difference I would say is that the U.S. program, although it started out being a zone, as you would picture a zone, a certain area that a company has to locate within to obtain benefits, that's still the way it is with many free zones around the world. You have to go to the zone. The U.S. program has really evolved in the last eight, 10 years to allow the foreign trade zone designation to really go to wherever the business is for the most part. So in most cases, uh, in, in my case in Atlanta, Georgia, we deal with companies that are spread out around a 60 mile area and the foreign trade zone designation sits at that company. Yamaha Motor Manufacturing is a foreign trade zone site in a suburb of Atlanta. Um, a General Electric company has the foreign trade zone designation on their facility in Northwest Georgia. So that's a big difference and it really came about because the U.S. Department of Commerce and Customs wanted to make it a simpler process for the business to obtain the designation and the benefits. Again, it's about economic development and job growth and we learned that it made more sense within our program framework to take the designation to the company. So that's the main uh, differences. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna 
shift gears slightly and we're gonna go back to some of those challenges we touched on. And um, being a CBP person, I'm going to say, most of the time the cargo is not delayed as a result of us. <laughs> but what generally happens oftentimes, um, we're the first agency you encounter and um, the primary agency you encounter on an outbound or inbound um, load. And so what that means is that we oftentimes represent a multitude of agencies that have importing or exporting authorities, okay? There are 47 of them um, that we represent. In many cases, um, we, we, are, we are entitled to enforce on their behalf their statutes or their regulations. So that's why you see us most of the time. Many of them don't have the resources at every port like we do. So that being said, as you can imagine, the enforcement was a little disparate. One between agencies across the country between ports of entry. So back in the Obama administration, there was an executive order that came out of the White House that said, done. You're all gonna play nice together and you're gonna create one single window and you're going to represent yourselves as one US government. So what does that mean to importers and exporters? Well, they were pretty tired of submitting multiple sets of data or forms multiple times to each agency, right? So industry said, one time, one place, you all figure out who gets what will be great for us. So that's what we did. Upon expiration of that executive order, industry went to the White House and said, hey, this is effective. You've got OMB on this group. There's oversight by the executive office of the president. You have OIRA sitting on this interagency group. We need it to stay intact. And so that is where we are today. That council is intact now. We have one US government processing system. And there are a few exceptions in which paper still needs to be submitted. Most of the time it's data. So on the government side of things, we're working hard to give this interagency one US government um, face, right? Well, I know I made that sound very simple. This was over a culmination of many years. So I'm going to turn to Jeff who shared <coughs> many of those working committees with me and my colleagues. And I think he's going to touch on some of the challenges there and what you can possibly do to avoid getting stuck by some of the other government agencies. Jeff? Thanks, Val. Yeah, so as, as Val said, this has been going on for a number of years, trying to get the government agencies to get together. F f from an importer's perspective, or even you know a foreign exporter coming into the United States, they're looking for consistency in the process. Is it going to be the same every time I, can br I, I, I bring product in so I can get it to my customer timely? Um, am I going to have visibility to that particular product as to, as to what's going on? Um, and can I have predictability? What, what is going to happen with that? Can I tell my customer exactly what's going on there? And what happened years ago was the, the port became a black hole. So we'd submit an entry into customs and customs would say, okay, it's good to go. Then another government agency would come and say, well, well wait a minute, I, I, I want to take a look at this. Let's grab it. And then you'd go do a sampling and they'd say park it over here and somebody else would pipe in and say, oh, wait a minute, I'd like to see it too. And no, no consistency, no visibility on this. So through this single window concept, we as a broker, as Val said, we can submit one large data set. Now this border interagency executive council and the international trade data system group determined what the data was. Um, uh, you know, not just because Val's sitting here, but <laughs> CBP has been very advanced to this. They're, they're very good, they're very effective at this. They've been managing the data for a number of years. This was something new to a number of the other government agencies. All of a sudden, their eyes got wide and said, I want all this data to come in. And the trade pushed back and said, well, wait a minute. You should get the day that you need just to release these goods. If you want something post-entry, we can provide that. But let's not all of a sudden be supplying 1,800 data elements or 300 of the same da data elements to you that we're doing to everybody else. Let's get efficient. CBP is the only government agency that has trade facilitation as part of its mission. We're trying to bring the other government agencies in that way. They still need to be effective in, in compliance and making sure that safe products come into the United States, but there can be a balance between those things. So with this single window, we've seen you know, just releases. We get a one US government release for the goods coming in right then and there, or we know exactly what's going on. 
we have visibility, we're providing that to our customers. So it has become easier. Now, the data that we're providing is much more. It's earlier in the process, but we're not submitting paper. We're not submitting and trying to get it faxed to somebody or snail mail to somebody to get something released. It's, it's, it's become very, very efficient. And we're still working on this. It, it isn't, you know, 100%, but we're on an external engagement committee with this Border and Trade Executive Council to work with all the trade associations to make sure that the government is moving in the same direction the trade wants it to. So there's a lot of very good dialogue on there. Very exciting. All right, so you have some representation, as you can tell. We do have some industry representatives working closely with our interagency council. Um, I have, since we're on the path of trade facilitation, I have time for one more question so I can give you all a chance to ask questions. So this question is going to be for Ron. And um, I'm hoping you can elaborate a little on some what trade agreement, the benefits of trade agreements and special programs could be for an importer or an exporter. Certainly. Um, and it actually goes to the last conversation also, and that is what Valerie said, know your product to start with, right? Let's unpack that. What does that mean, know your product? Well, of course, you're making it or you're selling it. You know what it is. But do you know what it is from the U.S. Customs perspective? Do you know what it is from those other 47 agencies that Customs is administering their laws, right? You're bringing it into the United States. So the question is, put another way, who regulates it? what precisely, which of those agencies are going to get involved and which of them are going to be interested in it. Over the years, I'm not quite old enough to have, have dealt with all 47, but I think I come close. Um, everything from uh, USDA, FDA for food, for pharmaceuticals, uh, USDA for, for agricultural items, Consumer Product Safety Commission for, for consumer products. We've had everything from, from dog toys to, uh, to, to electric hair dryers. A anything under the sun that comes in the border has probably got some other agency in addition to customs looking at it. And, and so knowing who regulates, make sure you're meeting those requirements before the shipment shows up because that's going to smooth the entry. Why are they asking questions? Why is customs asking questions? Why, why is the other agency asking questions? Because they regulate that product and they want to know it's safe, as, uh, as was said, for, for the US consumer. So it, it's a matter of working through that. And then when you know what your product is, then the customs question comes. Come, where is it classified? What's the country of origin? Um, what, what, uh, what's the customs value? That customs value suddenly has become really important now that we see 25% duties on, on some goods coming in. Yep. That wasn't very important when the average customs duties, I don't know what we say, a penny and a half, a percent right. and a half or so. You pay me more than you're going to save in looking at the uh, proper customs valuation. 25%, that makes a big difference. That may be your, more than your profit margin. It may be, may be operating the company uh, in the black or not. So, so looking at those issues, working through them up front, so they're not, you don't have to work through them when you don't know where the good is in the port, when you don't know which agency is the one holding it up, when you don't know what it is precisely that customs custom stop the good for, when your customer is screaming that it's going to be Christmas time soon <laughs> and they need to get them on the, on the shelves. Yeah. Worst of all, of course, is the tom ripe tomatoes. Yeah. Right? You do not want those held up in the hot sun at customs. Yeah. So, so working through that process of knowing what your product is and making sure you're meeting the requirements, making sure you got the paperwork. Excellent. Thank you. I want to add also for the export part of that, um, as Ron mentioned, other government agencies and Jeff mentioned, you know, our 
countries in which you would be importing to as you export out of the U.S. Many of them have counterpart agencies like that in place. And um, the Department of Commerce Export Development Centers can help you better understand what those requirements are. So um, we, again, just like the importing process, we work with other government agencies on the exporting process too. So. Um, we have time for some questions, so I wanted to see if anyone had any questions. We have some mics out, and we'll have some mics roving for those of you that are up along the walls so you don't have to climb over each other. We're going to make this as easy as possible. Any questions? No question? He faked us out, didn't he? <laughs> No, everyone's ready to go. Ready to go, get some. I know. Do you, how about my panelists? Do you have anything you want to share, add that we didn't touch on? I would just say for for me, for the kind of the parting thing is kind of to go full circle back to what we started. This is a lot of info we pumped out. Like I said, for our trade link, we spend four or five hours on it um, and get real into the weeds. But there are a lot of things you can go out and see through the customs website. If you're interested in FTZ at the individual grantee, Department of Commerce FTZ board site. Um, there's a lot of tools you can get. You'll get all of our info. Don't let it um, sound like it's difficult and a lot real fast and not look into it and, and talk at a deeper level about it. It's, it's niche, but it's not as hard as it sounds. And that's kind of where we got when we had that small business group. They would get everybody excited, but then they wouldn't do it because they just didn't want to take the plunge. There is stuff to be involved. You need to go into it eyes wide open, but there are tools. Not impossible, right? That's where we started out with. Not impossible. All right. Any? I, I, you know, I would just say, um, as was said earlier, start early. Start very, very early. Even, you know, well before the goods come to the United States. Don't wait for that to happen. Yeah. Know your product. Um, you know, what is the harmonized tariff schedule of that particular product coming in? So you know what uh, other government agencies may want to take a look at that. You may need samples before you're coming in. Um, Many times that we've brought uh, clients in to meet with CBP to make sure they have the proper classification. Um, CBP, you know, welcomes that. They're, they're looking for trade facilitation and, and you know, if, if you know your product and, and have all that information, um, they want to get it expedited as well. Uh, if you're going to be an importer of record, you can be as a foreign entity. Um, you do need to get a customs bond. Um, checks and balance is a system that basically everything that comes into the country requires some type of insurance to cover for the duties on those particular goods. Set that up well in advance, which may require getting financial information to the insurance underwriter. Um, so do everything in advance um, and don't wait for it to come here because that, that's where you're going to run into issues. I will share, write this down, binding ruling. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you know and you're in that early stage of the process that you're going to import goods, we have a program in Customs and Border Protection and you can even start it all online. Um, and what we will provide to you is a binding classification of your product. So you will know before it ever arrives what the duty rate determination is and that will be applicable at every port of entry. So every customs port of entry will abide and adhere to that binding ruling. You just have to have it, <laughs> okay? Um, Julie, anything, um, parting thought? The foreign trade zone component and the importing, exporting, if a company does, uh, is interested in doing that, I mentioned that the foreign trade zones board provides the designation for that site. Uh, I can't stress enough how important the customs piece is to that as well before a company even if they have the designation for their site, before they can actually start using the foreign trade zone procedures and getting the savings, they have to have really a second approval from their local customs port. So that's a, a huge piece of this. Uh, it's the real operational, technical side of setting up a foreign trade zone. Um, in my experience and with the companies that we work with, the relationship that the companies have with customs and with that foreign trade zone inspector is very, very positive. They get um, a lot of information up front that they need when they're considering it. And then ongoing, operationally, I think it's a very good relationship. Um, and, and our particular foreign trade zone officer helps them out quite a bit. Excellent, excellent. Ron, any parting thoughts for our attendees today? 
Yeah, I think final word is just uh, to, to echo Julie's comments about the FTZ, but to broaden that a little bit to say there's other preferential programs, whether that's NAFTA that we've heard about or the new improved NAFTA coming heard soon a yeah. <laughs> to a border a near you, um, whether it's uh, the GSP program, which is reduced duties for coming from certain less developed countries, the United States has a number of free trade agreements around the world, Israel, Bahrain, mm -hmm. Central America. Um, so there's quite a few out there uh, to, again, explore, do your research, take advantage of, just like the FTZs, to, to get the best benefit possible in, in the trade process. Back to the binding ruling. Uh, that process can also assist in the determination if your good qualifies for that trade program. So we're happy to help you there also. We want to make it as seamless as possible. Um, Jeff, did you have a Yeah, comment? Just, just one thing, you know, we're talking about the, the, the government and the regulations, but, you know, putting on my forwarder hat and logistics <laughs> hat, um, you know, I think as Shane said, look at the various ports. What is, what is the proper port for you to bring your goods in? There are some ports that specialize in certain things. Some are better at certain products than others. Some have greater distribution networks set up than other ones. Um, and, you know, is it better, you know, if you're coming from Asia to transship, bring it off the West Coast and bring it in. How expensive is that? Or is it going to the Panama Canal or go around the Suez Canal? Um, On-time performance of the carrier. So, you know, you just, just keep that in mind as well, that you can bring something in and get here, but, you know, what is the best port? What is the, what is the best mode of transport to get it here? And then what type of support services are at that particular port? If you're bringing some, some um, oversized pieces, do they have the equipment there to do it? They've got Moffies or low boys. Do they have the trucker capacity to handle it to get it where you want? Um, so there, there, there's a lot of uh, logistical requirements as well that you should, you should be looking into. All right, another chance for questions? No questions? All right, enjoy your afternoon. I understand it'll be a great time at the museum, so enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you for your time today.